Hello, Theory Underground friends. How are you? I'm A1 Spectacular Plus Plus. Um, how you doing? I don't even know if I need to put to record an intro for these. We all kind of already know why we're here in the first place. But nevertheless, I'm recording an intro, so this is the intro. This evening, Adam and Jordan joined me, and we read some more of chapter three of For They Know Not What They Do, uh, chapter three, Hegelian language. Um, we started at the paradox of sexuation, um, and we actually, Jordan took us through in a little bit more detail than we'd done before the formulae of sexuation, kind of went over that in more detail, and we speculated on some things, and we uh, maybe tried to restate some things a little bit clearer than they can be in the text um, and whether or not we were successful you decide um, and then we moved on to the next section how necessity arises out of contingency um, that was actually that's i like that section a lot it's really cool it goes over a lot of you know silly dumb seemingly pointless stuff that i find very entertaining i think it was a great reading session i love doing these thank you guys so much for your time um, Super duper looking forward to the next one. We don't have it set up yet, um, but hopefully we'll knock it out here um, before too much longer. And if there's other people out there that want to join too, um, come on in. The water's fine. Um, but yeah, so this is, for they know not what they do, chapter three. Um, we really only maybe read 15, 15 pages, maybe, give or take a dozen pages or so. Um, but it was, a, it was a great reading session. It was really cool. We asked some questions of each other. We chased some, you know, wild hairs down tails, uh, trails together and, and, uh, and had a, a genuinely super awesome time doing it. So I'm going to play that. You can go ahead and listen to it or... Look at the screen and read along if you want to do so, and we will see you soon. Um, stay classy, San Diego. <laughs> to watch any just... of my shit anyway. <laughs> you should know, by the way, 100% of the subscribers that I have are because I have a video of a chicken for 56 minutes or 56 seconds that got really, really popular like a, in Sri Lanka. Like a chicken? Like I was holding a baby chick in my hand, and that shit blew up, and I'm fucking famous in bengal nice mm. dude oh so it's a bot farm yeah absolutely absolutely also adam is not my real name <laughs> all right and i i do have captions on um i want to see if that uh, if that'll save a transcript or not. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so we're good to go from here or any other. Uh, you somewhere go else. With that, I'm good. You go with that, Jordan? Or, uh... Yeah, that works for me. All right. You want to do the honors, Mr. Nance? All right. The paradoxes of sexuation. We have thus set the passage from the judgment of reflection to the following form, the judgment of necessity. All we have to do is expressly posit the determination of universality, which in itself is contained in the universal judgment in concrete terms. Instead of all men are mortal, we have only to say man is mortal. The shift thus concerns the soul form. Although it is essential, even on the intuitive level, it is not difficult to sense how the statements, all men are mortal and man is mortal, do not have the same weight. With the sh shift from the first to the second, we move from the empirical set of all men, from what all men have in common, to universality, to the necessary determination of the notion of man as such. 
In other words, whereas in the judgment of reflection, we are still concerned with the relationship of the notional determination predicate to the contingent non-notional set of empirical entities, this, in the judgment of necessity, we enter the domain of necessary relationships of notion, of the imminent self-determinations of notion as such. Mortality is no longer the predicate of an extra notional entity, but the imminent determination of man. And actually, I think he puts a bow on that pretty nicely, but it starts getting into the uh, the formula. Um, so, so if 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 I'm recalling this correctly, and if 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 our if our understanding was was even correct in the first case, uh, we're supposed to we 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 should be able to reasonably intuit the difference between all men and man, as these these are not these are not actually synonymous with each other. One is one is a one is posed posed as a universal, and one is is posed as a collection of individuals. All men can be negated, man so cannot. Could you say one is prescriptive and one is descriptive? I I I feel I feel like that's I don't know. I I don't know if I'm if I'm if I would say which one was which on that. Honestly, I don't know if, if that matters so much. Um other than maybe just different ways to kind of get your head around what distinction he is making between, uh, well, I, I think if we push on, maybe if, yeah, if you, re if you recall we, when we, when we get further down, it starts, it starts uh, making some, some, some distinctions that help us to understand why is, why is all men different than man, man is all real. right. The, um, the entire reach of this shift could be more closely determined through the well-known paradox of the relationship between universal and existential judgment in the classical Aristotelian syllogism. Existential judgment implies the existence of the subject, whereas universal judgment is also true even if its subject does not exist, since it concerns only the notion of the subject. If, for example, one says at least one man is or some men are mortal, this judgment is true only if at least one man exists. If, on the contrary, one says unicorn has only one horn, this judgment remains true even if there are no unicorns, since it concerns solely the imminent determinedness of the notion of unicorn. Insofar as this distinction seems too hair-splitting, it should only be recalled how much weight the difference between the universal and the particular can have in the logic of emotions. If I know in general, without any particular details, that my wife sleeps around with other men, this need not affect me very deeply. The world comes crashing down only when someone brings me concrete details which confirm her adultery, a picture of her in bed with another man, and so on. The passage from the universal to the existential particularity makes all the difference. In short, if I know in general that my wife is deceiving me, I, in a way, suspend the reality of it. I treat it as non-serious. It becomes serious only with the passage to the particular. It is precisely this imbalance between existence and universality which provides the key to the paradoxes of the Lacanian formula of sexuation, in which on the masculine side of the universal function, all X are submitted to the function by implies the existence of an exception, there is at least one X which is exempted from the function. Whereas on the feminine side, a particular negation, non all X are submitted to the function, implies that there is no exception, implies that there is no exception. Uh, there is no X which could be exempted from the function. And this, yeah, this is the part that. So. So I I have something I'm circling here, but I I, I want to hear uh, Jordan. How are you feeling about the this section so far? What what, uh, what are you taking? I actually I was, um, 
what I was thinking was, is at least if we go back to the man is more, the difference between man is all men are mortal and man is mortal. Is that the difference between the universal and the universal particular maybe? Yes. Okay. And and from my, from my take from it, and, and I think, I think a really huge step here is when it's talking about the potential for an exception in in one case and or in fact implying an an exception in one case is what makes it is what concretizes it what makes it a a thing that actually exists all men are mortal implies that there may be one that may not be to say man is mortal it is just it's just like saying a unicorn has only one horn it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter if man exists or not to say man is mortal because all you're saying is the category of what makes man is is mortal is mortality to say all men are mortal is making a concrete statement that can be empirically verified or not um and and i think that's 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 really what he's circling here and then and then of course we're time the, the whole point is setting this up for that, for this weirdly biologically uh, essential uh, tie in here between masculine logic and feminine but logic. Not actually biologically essentialist, but just right. um, using language that could be confused for and appropriated by people doing biological essentialism. Yes, which absolutely was was what happened and we're stuck with that, but that's what we got for now and we're not going to sit here and rewrite the whole fucking dictionary. Um so that's what we got, but it's what's what's I think what's really important is like you uh, like you said Jordan, it is a question of of you know is this just a category of thing or is this a collective of individuals? man as a category and all men Versus as a examples of, of men um this this whole thing about if i know my you know it sucks i have experienced this whole if i know in general my wife is cheating on me but i haven't yet read the email that she sent this motherfucker <laughs> i was really okay with it right up until that email motherfucker yeah well, that's uh Oh, right. there is that that example of uh, I, you know, I don't know if Zizek is trying to make a reference to uh, you know Lacan saying that um, you know husband's paranoia about his wife cheating on him is pathological, even if it actually is happening. I don't know if he's kind of making a uh, slight reference to that. He does. I I I think he uses that example in Sublime Object. Okay. Or am I projecting? No, that it sounds it sounds right. Well, it certainly yeah, falls in line with that that the tendency that he has, and we were talking about this in our last conversation. The tendency that he has that you have a, you have read all of the accrete, you have read anything Freud has ever written, you've read all these things, and he's just going to make a passing remark to it because he assumes you've read it. And and uh, good thing I've got Chat GBT is all I'm saying. <laughs> oh my, my goodness voice um how, so how uh, you, let's see how are you feeling about the the uh uh the the symbols in the uh the uh because i i'm a little familiar with what these m- mean from reading bruce fink's uh book on lacan but it might please, be please do because it's yeah. <laughs> do you do you have a screen can you or do you have this up in front of you like because i feel like i would benefit from somebody you know Marking. hovering their cursor over whatever whichever thing the bar on top means a negation right um is conditional logic is this is what we're seeing here I, yes i believe so um i do not know off the top of my head which ones are which, but I could um, I, I could grab my my Bruce Fink book and and look that up really quickly. It might be helpful for people to. I mean, because this is kind of like you know seeing the 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 phallic signifier and the null, all these these formulas are kind of abstract. So, 
I think that would actually add value to Let me... um, future consumers. Yeah. I, I was thinking if I didn't know what the hell any of these things meant, I would be like, I'd be rolling my eyes at this page. Well, we blew right the fuck past it on our last read through. <laughs> we were like, well, that looks like a lot of weird letters that are upside down. <laughs> okay. Um, so the top left one, that one means all men are subject to castration. And then the one be directly below that um, represents that there is one who is not subject to castration. So the primal father. Primal father, okay. And then the one in the um, top left or top top right um means sorry just a moment the one in the am i missing it okay the one in the top top left means that you cannot find even one woman for whom the phallic function is totally inoperative. Okay, can we can we try to simplify that? Um, say it again? Um, you cannot find even one woman for whom the phallic function is totally inoperative. So I guess what that would essentially mean is you cannot find even one woman who is not subject to, uh, let's say, patriarchy. Okay. To some extent. I think so the women, women have no, necessarily there is no female primal father. Uh, I, I think that's, I think you could say that. Um, and then the top, the bottom right one is that not all of a woman comes under the law of the phallic signifier or this, or the, the signifier. Um, and so this is usually meant to, uh, mean that there's some part of every woman who somehow kind of escapes the um you know the symbolic the law language um and then lacan of course has this idea of feminine jouissance um and so those are those are what those four um symbols or series of symbols means um well, that so that's that's good that we have that because he goes on to speak in uh, to to reference these from an in, with entirely different language, and so I, I'm just going to confess my ignorance of of Lacan. Like I don't have the ecri in my uh, under you know notch on my belt. Me, me and, either. <laughs> so so a lot of those words I know mean stuff, uh, but they don't have much relevance i don't i don't understand what for example when you said uh women subject to phallic uh function i i have no idea what that means but i but i do see that we're gonna have some a little bit of we're gonna have a little bit of discussion here underneath it and and what i think might also be useful then is to try to try to tie these this algebra to these statements below yeah. Um, so where were we? Where did we leave off reading from? We're at common sense. 
So you just did a whole bunch. I'm a, I'll, I'll, I'll take, uh, unless Jordan, would you like to, to read? Or actually, you just did a bunch of reading. You just read some Finkel? Fink, Bruce Fink, from uh, the Lacanian subject between language and jouissance. Great introduction to Lacan um, and relatively short. So recommend taking, taking, checking it out. Excellent. Um, the, I I need to make sure to, to write. Here. You know what? I'm going to, if you don't mind, I, I'm pulling out my notes here. If I could uh, get you to say that one more time so that I could write it down. Um, make sure that I've got this. Okay. So it's Fink, F-I-N-K? F-I-N-K. And the title is The Lacanian Subject. Okay. Yeah, I'll check. Very good. Okay, and then I'll, I'll begin reading here from uh, Common Sense, if it's all the same. Great. Right. Let's see. Um, common Sense would suggest that the formula, if linked in two diagonal pairs are equivalent, is not all x are submitted to the function phi, strictly equivalent to there is no x which could be exempted from the function phi. All right. And on the other hand is non-all x are subject are, are submitted to the function phi not strictly equivalent to there is at least one x which is exempted from the function phi yet as we have just seen for lacan the equivalence runs vertically so they're not meant to go in diagonals they're meant to go vertical we approach the solution if we do not read the universal quantifier from the lower pair of the formula on the level of reflective judgment but on the level of the judgment of necessity not all x are submitted to the function phi, but x as such is submitted to the function phi. So it so it's saying not it's not all men are mortal, but instead men as such are submitted or are are mortal. Not all men are mortal, but men as such are mortal. If I'm reading that right, Lacan's phi, of course, means the function of symbolic castration. Man is submitted to castration implies the exception of at least one, the primordial father of the Freudian myth in totem and taboo, a mythical being who has had all women and was capable of achieving complete satisfaction. Yet we are better remaining with our example of mortality. True, there is no man who is immortal, is equivalent to all men are mortal, but not, as we have already seen, the equivalent of man is mortal. In the first case, we are concerned with the empirical set of men in which we take them one by one and thus establish that there is no one who is immortal. Whereas in the second, we are concerned with the very notion of man. And Lacan's basic pr uh, premise is that the leap from the general set of all men into the universal man is possible only through an exception. The universal in its difference to the empirical generality is constituted through the exception. We do not pass from the general set to the universality of one notion by way of adding something to the set, but on the contrary, by way of subtracting something from it, namely the unary feature, the trait feature, which totalizes the general set, which makes out of it a universality. So this is where I suppose I made last, last conversation, I suppose I made the, the interestingly backwards uh, logical statement here that what we what we what happens when we go from all men to man i had said before what happens when we go from all men to man is that we are we are removing the possibility of of an exception when we go to man we're going from all men where there is an exception to man where there is no exception and apparently i guess i was backwards on that um and it was more that when we go from man to all men, we're adding the exception. Yeah. I'm not super clear on <laughs> the fucking difference except for that being said in reverse, but um, I'm, I'm, you know, what can I say? I, I'm not super clear on that. And I'm, I am looking forward to, uh, to hearing the, the discourses said through Mr. Downs. Uh, impression i almost want to say is that this almost I, i'm still having trouble parsing the logic but my 
instinct is that Zizek is almost trying to get at the same thing as when he says, you know, the difference between coffee without milk versus coffee without cream, how ostensibly they're both negatives, but the way in which they're negated uh, matters. I almost want to say that there's something familiar about, about uh, I feel like the logic here, um, but I could be wrong. Well, I think part of, I think part of what's, <clears throat> I think part of what's lacking in the, the coffee, uh, the coffee thing is the, the sexuation, uh, because there isn't, I, I think it would be more helpful if there was like a, I don't know, like a gendered version of the coffee. Uh, coffee and tea. You know, coffee and tea, for example. Maybe <laughs> coffee is more of a masculine thing and tea is more of a feminine. And then, then we could see how we could translate that over to this because sexuation is what's key here. Uh, the, 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 one of the things that, that I felt like I was starting to understand uh, was, was the notion that there is a representative of what quintessential man is supposed to be as long as you live in a feudal or a, mon a monarchy where you have a quintessential actual biologically existing that's what the man is when you have that then you have the ability to negate that with through through all the rest of the the men who are gonna try to who want to be that but can never be that and therefore they're already subject to that that uh what is it castration um whereas on the feminine side of things there is no actual at least from lacan's uh on lacan's presentation there is no feminine version of that there isn't no. a a quintessential female per se uh and and so there's going back to coffee and uh without cream and coffee without milk it's i i i would have trouble drawing the the which one is the which one represents the there's no sexuation involved in that i guess is is the thing and and i personally am not super i don't feel like i really grasp the, I feel like I have a better handle on what the masculine side of this is than what the what is intended by the feminine side. Um, but we may we may get to that. Uh, one of the things that we did discuss uh, on our last conversation is that something can happen when you're trying to parse this stuff paragraph by paragraph. In that he's mid thought, he's mid thought all the way through this book. <laughs> but mm -hmm. certainly he's mid thought in the paragraph, and so trying to trying to parse a paragraph at a time uh can can be in can be problematic it might be good to to continue um and see if we can maybe recover from from earlier where we we get that um uh, where what what what's going on here um jordan would you like to, to read from there there is an abundance sure. there is an abundance of examples here for the masculine side of totalization through exception, as well as for the feminine side of non-all collection without exception. Was it not Marx who, in the first chapter of Capital, in the dialectic of commodity form, in the articulation of the three forms by which a commodity expresses its value in some other commodity which serves as its equivalent, was the first to develop the logic of totalization through exemption? The expanded form passes into the general form when commodity is when some commodity is excluded, exempted from the collection of commodities, and thus appears as the general equivalent of all commodities, as the immediate embodiment of commodity as such, as if by the side of all real animals there existed the animal, the individual incarnation of the entire animal kingdom. It is only through this totalization, through exemption, that from the empirical set of all commodities, we arrive at the universality of commodity, incarnated in, in individual commodities. On another level, Hegel repeats the same operation apropos of the monarch. The set of men becomes a rational totality, the state, only when their unity as such is incarnated in some non-rational biologically defined individual, the monarch. What is of special interest to us here is the way Hegel determines the exceptional character of the monarch. All other men are not by their nature what they are, but must be made, educated, formed, whereas the monarch is unique in being by his nature that which is his symbolic mandate. 
we have here in clear form the exemplification of the masculine side of Lacan's formulae of sexuation. All men are submitted to the function of castration. They are not directly that which is their symbolic mandate. They arrive at their positive social role only through the hard work of negativity, their inhibition, training, on condition that there is the one who is exempt from it, who is by nature that which he is, the king. The paradox simultaneously helps in understanding the Hegelian logic of the negative self-relationship of the notion. A universal notion arrives at its being for itself. It is posited as notion only when in the very domain of particularity, it reflects itself in the form of its opposite, in some element which negates the very fundamental feature of its notional universality. The notion of man as an act of being, a being which is not by nature that which it is, but must create itself, define itself through hard work, arrives at being at its being for itself by reflecting itself in an exception, and in an individual who appears as the embodiment of man in general, as such, precisely insofar as he is already by his nature what he is, the monarch. Value, in its contrast to use value, that is to say, value as the expression of a social relationship is posited as such when it is embodied in some particular commodity, when it appears as quasi natural, as a quasi natural property of some particular commodity, money, gold. As far as the other feminine side of the formulae of sexuation is concerned, it is sufficient to recall how the notion of class struggle works in historical materialism. The good old leftist slogan. Today, in the supposedly post-ideological world more valid than ever, there is nothing that is not political, must be read not as the universal judgment, everything society as a whole is political, but on the level of the feminine logic of a non-all set. There is nothing that is not political means precisely that the social field is irreducibly marked by a political split that there is no neutral zero point from which society could be conceived as a whole. In other words, there is nothing that is not political means that in politics also there is no meta language. Any kind of description or attempt at conceiving society by definition implies a partial position of enunciation. In some radical sense, it is already political. We have always already taken sides. And the class struggle is none other than the name for this unfathomable, unfathomable limit split, which cannot be objectivized, located within the social totality, since it is itself that limit which prevents us from conceiving society in general as a totality. So it is precisely the fact that there is nothing that is not political, which prevents society from being conceived as a whole. Even if we determine this whole with the predicate political and say all is political. Okay, so in my mind, I'm immediately thinking, okay, so there is no female analog to the monarch. There can't be. Yeah, like by definition, the 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 feminine is that which resists the it would be the absence of a possibility of a monarch. It, it can't be totalized. There's no the woman. I mean, that may be. Yeah. That, that may now, be. now that it's time to to make definitive statements, I don't want to make any. But we can we can make statements and <clears throat> and be wrong. I I am very good at that. Uh, that's actually my 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 secret power. So I'm good at making very, very strong statements that are wrong. <laughs> well, okay, I, I, I don't completely understand the graph of sexuation, but what I will say is that I believe Lacan, I believe to some extent there is a possibility of envisioning a different society where maybe there could be something like a primal mother where the idea of of 
everyone being under the reign of, of the phallic signifier of patriarchy, of domination, maybe there would no longer be uh, the primal father. And, and, and first of all, Lacan doesn't, Freud doesn't actually believe there was ever such a thing as the primal father. It's something that we uh, perhaps unconsciously posit as existing in some remote past. Of course, we know that it never actually existed doesn't mean it doesn't still um, uh, have an effect. Um, so I don't want to say that, I don't know, per perhaps there couldn't be somehow a female equivalent of uh, the primal father, but so would, 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 we... would be a different society. It wouldn't be what uh, we've been living under at least for if we were to posit a primal mother, would that be would that be just a utopian um, all needs are seen to um, you? The, I mean, the, the feminine is is meant to represent the <clears throat> the non the the, the not cream <laughs> the, the the non subject to castration so there's there is no so from from if i'm from my my take on this it, the feminine is is society the feminine represents the aspect of society itself in that in that there is no way to total there isn't a way to totalize society in the yeah. way that there is a way to totalize the masculine ideal under the monarch you have you have men that are always ever becoming you can't always ever be unbecoming, right? There isn't there isn't a there isn't a function for that, and so the the aspect of so going from uh, there is nothing that is not political roughly correlates to the uh, the function. Um, I'm gonna look on one twenty three. Um, Forgive me if I'm looking for it. There is no X which could be exempted from the function phi, which is the 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 female, the the female sexuated opposite of the all X are submitted to the function phi. Um, and what he's doing down here in uh, on 125 is that the class struggle itself is the the is the it, it it might be it might be <clears throat> it might be a way of saying the class struggle is what the uh what you would call the primal mother is the primal mother is the class struggle is the is the omnipresent state of of being that makes society actually be a thing that is doing something and, and not static so long as everyone is, is as long as there is struggle there is actually society if there is no longer struggle there wouldn't be society you would never have you would never have a society in which there wasn't struggle because there's always going to be an, there's always going to be someone trying to get theirs. Yeah, I mean, I do want to kind of, but you know, I want to say that at least with Lacan's logic, as as it is, there is, I don't think that he could con he could conceive of there being a primal mother because his idea is that the relations between the two sides of 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 the graph there there is a non-relation they're they're asymmetrical not necessarily in terms of a power but in terms of they're not parallel to each other they're not even perpendicular to each other they don't even they don't even meet um and so but I, I do like your idea, Adam, of the idea of class struggle kind of representing um, the same thing in Lacan's graph of sexuation, where class struggle represents the non-all, just like the idea there's a part of every woman that is not dominated by, by the signifier, by language, by law, by the symbolic. Um, 
and, and Zizek is trying to say class struggle is somewhat analogous because it's it's the um, impediment to society truly being uh, a coherent totality, just like the which is what makes is. society even possible because yeah. <clears throat> yeah. society wouldn't couldn't exist. And and I think it also kind of roughly aligns with the the concept of that there is no woman uh, as a Lacanian yep. concept. And so to say there is nothing is no, you could say is roughly analogous to yeah. there is no woman. There is nothing that is not political. Then would would uh, allow that to line up. It could also be that we're we're a little bit getting in the weeds trying to create a binary out sure. of this. Like you know, there's a monarch, so there should be a a, a, a queen or some shit. Um, so while well, we're at is this logic of non all, however. Yeah. Um, Nancy, you want to you want to take it from there? Is this logic of non all, however, compatible with Hegelian dialectics? Does it not rely on one of the key topics of traditional criticism of Hegel, that of the irreducible gap separating universality and the reality of particular existence? Is not the Hegelian illusion that the particular can be deduced from and absorbed without any remnant into? the self-movement of the universal notion? And is it not precisely in opposition to the lesson of the Aristotelian logical square that there is an irreducible gap between the universal and existence, that existence cannot be deduced from the universal? Bacon actually tries to demonstrate from this gap the anxiety to which Hegel's panlogicism gave rise with Schelling and Kierkegaard, Anxiety that our entire existence would be subsumed into the self-movement of the notion and thus lose its uniqueness, its paradox of bottomless freedom. As Freud put it, anxiety is the only affect which does not deceive by means of which we encounter the real, the real of a lost object which cannot be absorbed into a circular movement of symbolization. However, if we admit the paradox of the Hegelian rational totality, that can be discerned, for example, apropos of the king as the condition of the state qua rational totality, the entire perspective changes. Insofar as anxiety demonstrates the proximity, not the loss, of an object qua real, as Lacan inverts, inverts Freud, one should ask which object we have come too close to with the establishment of a rational totality. This object is, of course, precisely that absolutely contingent object the little piece of the real, which emerges as an incarnation of the rational totality itself, through which the rational totality arrives at its being for itself, at its actuality, in the case of the state, the king as biological contingent individual. This is the object whose existence is implied with the universality itself, since only through it is the universal posited, does it arrive at its being for itself. Hegel is therefore far from transcending the gap between the universal and particular existence by way of deducing the particular from the self-movement of the universal notion. He rather exposes the contingent particularity to which the universal itself is linked, as with an umbilical cord. In the language of the formulae of sexu sexuation, he exposes the particular exception which much must exist if the universal function is to remain in force. <clears throat> So I have I have visualized this. Uh, I made a little a little GIF, um, put it in the uh, aesthetic reflections on the forum, of uh, oh yeah of a, of a donut, like basically in, involuting inverting into itself, losing its matter out of its ass basically, and then recovering matter from around it in in a in a kind of a continual process when i read this and i'm sure i'm way off base but when i read this this is what what strikes me is the notion that for things to move for things to not be just stuck in place for things to be static there must be a gap to move into there must be there must be something missing from the totality and instead of saying we will never be able to we will never be able to understand everything instead of saying that 
what I'm what I feel like is being said is that part of understanding everything is recognizing that there's still always going to be more. There's well, still always going to be more. Yeah, and it, your 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 particular understanding will always be insufficient to the totality of of it. Like that's part of understanding everything is also not understanding, and you have to incorporate that lack of understanding into so the moment you think you have a total totalized understanding is probably the moment at which you're the most you're the most wrong perhaps the most off base is you can't possibly have covered every base the moment you've got a runner on each base there's another base you're missing someone yeah or or you realize you're yeah, you're playing basketball instead of uh, baseball. Like, yeah, it's you, you, you simply can't. Like, you just, you can't. As a condition of being you, you cannot have what you don't have and what you can't have. Uh, I'm not saying what I want to be saying. He does talk about the movement from, um, From where did where does he say it? No, I lost it. But earlier when we had talked about adding versus subtracting, adding the the exception versus subtracting the exception, it, I guess it doesn't really matter why it goes in that direction. Um, you could do it the other way around, but the reason it, it goes to adding is because you're moving from the universal to the particular. So you're moving in that direction to close in upon an identity or notion. Well, I have, uh, I think I've, I've reached my, my, I think I've reached the limit of what I think I grasp out of this before <laughs> getting a, you know, I don't know what to say, getting, getting Mikey's take to maybe help me uh, course correct or whatever. Like I, I've shot my shots for my Kentucky windage. I'm just not sure where they landed just yet. It's kind of where I'm feeling. Uh, shall we, shall we move on? Yeah. What was that? We're all students. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. I it's just the kind of off, off the subject. I, part of the thing I really enjoy out of this, I, I have, frankly, I've made a, a lifetime social uh, habit out of being the smartest motherfucker in the room. I, I've always found ways to, be the the one guy at the party that actually reads books or whatever and so you know that was always my game and it worked uh and uh you know welcome to the I'm real not, buddy yeah baby uh so now i'm uh, yeah what i'm really enjoying about this is i'm finding myself the opposite I, i'm like you know i'm just happy i'm here guys thanks for letting me in um anyway i can tap a keg like reliably yeah. uh so. yeah i feel like the like the light crew or the camera guy like i like i not really supposed to be here i'm just yeah here by consequence yeah just grab a broom and just be sweeping um i won't get detail all right <laughs> um should, should we move should we move into a necessity arises out of contingent contingency let's do it i i can uh, i can take over again all right how necessity arises out of contingency. Let us then return to the judgment of necessity. As we have seen, the predicate in it is posited as a necessary, inherent specification as a self-determination of the subject. So we come to the first form of the judgment of necessary, to the categorical judgment, by which the categorical, the notional necessary, 
relationship between subject and predicate is posited as the relationship between a species and its genus. A rose is a plant, woman is human, for example. However, this judgment is inadequate insofar as it leaves aside the fact that the content of the genus is not only this species. The genus articulates within it a series of species. The other form of the judgment of necessity, hypothetical judgment, thus posits a particular content species of the genus in its necessary relationship with another species. Let us say in our case, where there are women, there are also men, or rather, the being of woman is not only its own, but also the being of another, of man. And the third form, the disjunctive judgment, the particular content of the judgment is explicitly posited as self-articulation, self-specification of the universal notion. A human is either a man or a woman. Here at this precise point, we encounter the greatest surprise of Hegel's theory of judgment. That is to say, from the stereotyped view of Hegel, we would expect now to be at the end. Does not the triad of judgments, existence, reflection, necessity, encapsulate the triad of being, essence, notion? Is not the judgment of existence condemned to dissolution into an empty tautology precisely in so far as it remains on the level of being, and as such is not able to render the reflective relationship between subject and predicate. Is not the judgment of reflection, as the name itself suggests, a judgment which articulates the relationship of some contingent phenomenal entity to its essential determination, a relationship in, with, in which this essential determination is reflected in the plurality of contingent entities? And finally, does the judgment of necessity does not not deliver us from contingent externality? Is the entire content within it not explicitly posited as a result of the self-movement of the universal notion? That is to say, as its imminent self-specification, what can possibly follow? Hegel's answer is contingency. The judgment of necessity is followed by a fourth form, the judgment of the notion. Only with this does this judgment actually become that which the word suggests, an appraisal of something. Predicates which contain the, this judgment are not predicates on the same level as predicates of the former forms of judgment. Notional judgment is literally judgment on the notion. The content of the predicate here is the very relationship to the subject to its of the subject to its notion. So to that which was the predicate in the previous forms of judgment, it is a predicate of the type good, bad, beautiful, righteous, true. According to Hegel, truth is not simply the adequacy or correspondence of some proposition to the object or to the state of things which the proposition describes, but the adequacy of the object itself to its own notion. In this sense, we could say some we could say about some real object, a table, for example, that it is true insofar as it conforms to the notion of table, the function it must perform as a table. Notional judgment has to be located on this level. We evaluate with it the extent to which something is true, how far it corresponds to its notion. The first immediate form of notional judgment Asatoric judgment therefore comprises propositions of the type, this house is good. The problem which of course immediately arises is, not, is that not every house is good. Some houses are, some are not. Depends on a series of contingent circumstances. The house must be built in a predetermined way and so on. The second form of notional judgment, problematic judgment, problematizes precisely these conditions of the truth of the object, the subject of the judgment. Whether a house is good or not depends on the circumstances and what kind of house it is. The third form, apodietic judgment, displays in a positive form the conditions of truth of the subject of the judgment 
such and such construction of a house is good, such and such an act is lawful, and so forth. It is not difficult to work out the passage here from judgment into syllogism, since one already finds oneself within the syllogism as soon as the elements contained in the notional judgment are posited as such. Such and such a construction of a house is good. This house is built in such a way. This house is good. It is also not hard to guess how the fourth form of judgment affirms the moment of contingency. The circumstances on which whether or not the house is good are dependent, whether it is really a house, whether it corresponds to its notion, are irreducibly contingent, or rather posited as such by the very form of the judgment of the notion. Therein consists the crucial shift from the second to the third form of judgment of the notion. From the problematic to the apodeitic judgment, a problematic judgment imposes in an external way the inner necessary notion of the object. What a house must really be to be a house, uh, what house must be to really be a house, and the external contingent conditions on which it is dependent, whether some empirical house is really a house, an apodeitic judgment surpasses this external relationship between contingency and necessity, between the contingent conditions and the inner of the notion. How? Okay. Um, so one of the things that happens to me when I'm reading Zizek and, and, and I don't know about y'all is I come across these terms that he throws out there um, that seem like they're really important to, to knowing what that term is to, uh, to evaluate what he's saying after. Uh, and this is where I, this is where I, I lean heavily on like Wikipedia and, uh, lately, uh, chat GPT, because it's actually just a quicker way of doing it. Um, it avoids the Wikipedia hole. Um, do, do y'all feel like, you know, what assertoric judgment is? And if not, <laughs> would you like me to read you the, what I've got no. sitting on my screen here? <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. So, so knowing that this is, this is coming from chat GPT, which can be wrong, but let's, let's, I'm okay with being wrong. I feel like this gets me closer to the truth. Um, in philosophy, assertoric judgment is a type of proposition used to make a claim about the world, asserting, and that's where the word is coming from, asserting something is or is not the case. So assertoric judgments are, assertoric judgments are the most common type of judgment used in everyday language. They are characterized by their ability to be true or false, and they can be evaluated based on whether they accurately correspond to reality or not. For example, the sky is blue is an assertoric judgment because it makes a claim about the world that can be evaluated for its truth or falsity based on whether the sky is actually blue. Um, okay, now we have a podiatic a, a judgment. Um, now this is uh, a proposition that is considered to be necessarily and absolutely true, mm -hmm. such that its negation is not only false, but logically contradictory. In other words, an apo Apodeictic judgment is a statement that is indubitably certain and necessarily true. Up is um, above you. One classic example of this kind of apodeictic judgment is the statement, the whole is greater than the part. The statement is considered to be necessarily true as it is fundamental principle of mathematics and it is a fundamental principle of mathematics and logic, and its negation would result in a contradiction. Another example is the statement two plus two equals four, which is considered to be necessarily true and cannot be negated without contradiction. So we're talking about we're talking about all the different kinds of ways to make make evaluations of truth, and I guarantee I'm going to need to reread this section <clears throat> three or four times. To feel like I have a a a grasp on, on the direction of it, I personally found this this concept about the table uh, up on one twenty seven. Um, in this sense, we could say about some real object, the table, for example, that it is true insofar that it conforms to the notion of a table, the function it must perform as a table. Uh, this this is an interesting kind of thing because you know you can start you can start like saying what exactly is a table like does a human being become a table if they get on all fours and you put plate on them and you eat off their back 
are they a table true right but um is a hammer you know can you use anything as a hammer and then is it then a hammer <laughs> like can you just hit stuff with stuff and that's a hammer now um and uh then there's there's the the form of judgment that comes in of necessity Hang so on, according to Hegel, talking about according to Hegel, truth is not simply the adequacy or correspondence of some proposition, um, but the adequacy of the object itself to its own notion. So to think of a human being bent over with with a uh, a plate on their back and calling that a, a table, I think arguably goes against the idea of tableness, a notional table. That is definitely very different fundamentally from a, a thing maybe made of wood with four, four legs and, and, you know, flat surface. Um, but uh, so uh, we've got Nance AFK now. How, how are you feeling about this section here, Jordan? Yeah, this section is, is, is rough for me as well. Um, I am I'm pretty weak on the Hegel side of Zizek. Um, so, you know, this is a section where I kind of just throw up my hands and say the best I can do is try to look up some definitions and come up with some good questions. Um, and then, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, Mikey is able to, uh, you know, interpret some of this stuff yeah I'm, wait, I'm waiting to see what the which which wu-tang reference is gonna is gonna pop out here like is this a cream situation or is this more of a gravel pit like scenario um so uh i i i feel the same way i i feel very i feel very comfortable in saying i do not grasp this well and i'm looking forward to seeing either if it resolves by the end of the section or if we can get something from Mikey or if we, if we figure out something the way, how about you, Nance? How are you feeling about apodictic, apodictic judgments and how they relate? So it, uh, I feel, I mean, fairly comfortable with this like the tautologies and notions of truth and, and uh, the contingency um, as to where it's going. <sighs> yeah. I don't want to blow my load uh, early. Um, so don't, that's okay. Yeah. I, you know, I, one thing I do want to reference, uh, we are the, the, section heading here is hegelian le, it's it's the language uh that is a that is a he's that's his use of the word the which is the the lacanian you know term for a, almost a pre pre-language the babbling that we do Earth. and so i think that that may be maybe uh, you know part of the the insight we should be heading towards is that this is a means for which we are we're discussing the babbling. Uh, we're discussing how how things go from just being babbling to starting to make sense. Um, it, perhaps I don't know. That's it took me a minute to get my head around that whole concept. Anyway, in fact, it took a lot of looking to figure out what the fuck was meant by the language. Um, that, that's just not helpful. I gotta say, Jacques, <laughs> with your new I mean words and shit. I got. I gotta say that that actually is one of the the concepts that I, from Lacan, that I I kind of intuitively, uh, under, understood because I I understood it in the sense of like I don't know when, like with a lot of like absurdist humor. Like if you ever if you've ever seen like Tim and Eric or something, a lot of their humor is on the level of La Longue, where they're just like same twisting words slightly differently or repeating them and you don't know why it's funny but it's because it's purely at the level of 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 the sound 
of language in certain words. Mm. And I think that's what Lacan means by, like, of course, it's something that babies do, but it's also something that, you know. Well, we still do. That we do all the time, you know. That's that that was what I I I felt very I felt like it was it was more important uh it was something that I needed to look more into was because it's what's what's inherent to it is not that that's what babies do and then you stop doing it and now you're speaking language but that when you're speaking language you're still doing it yeah. And, yeah. and you might you might sound like you're making more sense now but that's only because you have developed that symbolic register to such a point where after the fact that shit does sound like me but you know what if if you play back this audio there are going to be places where we make statements that don't resolve mm. oh that sounds like gibberish then, our our former president was amazing at that right like it's <laughs> when you read it back it's like did this fucking guy say any words or mm. was this just syllables that happen to sound like words because they don't actually make any sense um yeah uh, I, 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 so anyways, that's the, I, I noticed, I, I just realized, oh yeah, that's, that's actually the, the heading here. And so we, part of what perhaps we'll be getting to is how this, how this inherently is part of how we understand things through language. Um, we're on the traditional answer has of course been, I guess if it's all good, I'll read from here. Um, the traditional answer has of course been by way of conceiving the notion as teleological necessity, do we all know what teleological means? Yeah, okay. Um, which prevails through inherent logic and regulates the apparent external set of circumstances in accordance with the usual idea that in dialectics, the necessity realizes itself through a set of contingencies. Examples that immediately come to mind are those of the great historical personalities like Caesar or Napoleon. In the course of the French Revolution, its own imminent logic brought about the necessity of a passage from the Republican form into that of personal dictatorship. That is, the necessity of a person like Napoleon, the fact that this necessity realized itself precisely in the person of Napoleon was, however, due to a series of contingencies. As in, that could have been anybody. It just was Napoleon. He ended up, that that person ended up in those shoes, but that was all, that historically was going to happen. To me, this is where I get a little weird with the the Hegelian historicism uh, because it's like there's almost a, there's like a fatalism to that that I'm not sure I'm on board with, and I and I feel like maybe I'm missing something because I don't I feel like that's that's wrong. That has been a criticism of of Hegel and and of Marxism and dialectical materialism that it's teleological. Um, and to be honest, sometimes I feel like it is, but then sometimes I feel like, no, it's not. And I can see through it. I, I, feel I do like that's feel a like Zizek is trying to say that over and over again, that no, it's not actually teleological. There's a gap. That's part of it. And, and but that's, I'm not getting it. I'm not getting why it's not. I, I guess the fatalism would be if the necessity was that it had to be Napoleon. Okay, that... So it was going to happen, but if you assume that Napoleon, that it was going to be Napoleon, that it was Napoleon, then that would be fatalism. I, but it's I, not fatalistic to assume that it was going to happen. I mean, I get you could. I guess you could still say that. I I think Hegel would say that the necessity there there is a necessity, but the content that that fills in uh, what what uh will will fill in that necessity is is up for grabs and that's okay. where the contingency comes in so that's um uh, but you could still say like even that even that is teleological i i guess well but not it, it's, maybe not essentially or maybe not it's a, not in the maybe not in the way most people conceive i think uh, may, maybe it's more of a consequential this this brings me this brings me to the uh the the part of the sublime object where he starts talking about the great leap uh the tiger's leap backwards and and I want to reread that because I might I have a better vocabulary now so I might be able to understand it better but one of the things 
one of the things he points out about historicism is that it's always done after the fact, or at least it's always interpreted as such after the fact by people who are already have their eyes open look, expecting historicism. When these things happen, they, they, they of course happened. And we know from documentation that these things happen. And so because we're expecting a certain thing, we're expecting a pattern. When we're expecting a pattern, we go looking for one. When we go looking for one, we find one. And therefore, we in, we intuit a teleology that doesn't doesn't didn't have to be there, but it's undeniably the fact that these things happened and they did happen in this order. Uh, and so, the fact of its contingency gives that sense of of fatalism. But it's probably because we're stuck looking backwards. We can't we can't 100% guarantee what's going to happen in the future. So we to say it's a, a, a fatalism would be like we could make an accurate prediction about the future 100 percent of the time and uh we can't we we arguably cannot i don't know um but you, you, that's that's that is has always been my impression of hegel and marx in fact i've in in the past and in, in not very long ago have have said it, it seems like marx has this kind of uh uh um congenital hegelianism that led to certain positions that led to where what happened with what happened with the various attempts at bringing about communism um and that's because it unfortunately lends really well towards the kind of person who wants to use teleological concepts to justify all the other shit that they're about to make you do or they're you know you end up with gulags but you end up with gulags under all the circumstances. Uh, I don't know. Uh, shall we continue? This is how Hegel's theory of contingency is usually conceived. Or do we have more on this? Okay. This is how Hegel's theory of contingency is usually conceived. Contingency is not abstractly opposed to necessity, but its very form of appearance. Necessity is the encompassing unit a unity of itself and its opposite. Yet Hegel's theory on how a given phenomenon ascertains its necessity by positing itself, its contingent presuppositions opens up the possibility of a rather different reading. The possible, which became actual, is not contingent, but necessary, since it posits itself its own conditions. Necessity posits itself its conditions, but it posits them as contingent. In other words, when out of the contingent external conditions, their result takes shape, these, contingent, these conditions are retroactively, from the viewpoint of the final result itself, perceived as its ne necessary conditions. Um, I think this roughly corresponds to what I was saying about when you're, uh, you're looking for the pattern, you go, or you, you're expecting a pattern, you go looking for the pattern, you find the stuff that satisfies that pattern, you have developed a retroactive impression of con of necessity that was actually built out of con contingencies um, dialectics is ultimately a teaching on how necessity emerges out of contingency on how a contingent bricolage produces a result which transcodes its initial con conditions into internal necessary moments of its self-reproduction it is therefore necessity itself which depends on the contingency. The very gesture which changes necessity into contingency is radically contingent. Oh my gosh. Speaking of word play humor, it remind this this whole thing reminds me of that the section in I, I don't know if it was Tommy Boy or or something where they're like tripping out Limits. on road. road. Limits. Roads. Road. Roads. I'm I'm serious. I'm Say contingency one more time, motherfucker. <laughs> I I really like this, the play between contingency and, and, and necessity. I guess it is difficult to put into words. Um, like if you were to say that things are, things are, the way they are necessarily like 
that would be to, to make a, an argument, like a teleological argument. Things are going to happen this way because they have to happen this way. But then if, if you say things have to happen that way because they did happen that way, like it's it's like a retroactive necessity. I I'm a fucking moron. I wish I could express. No, I I I, I it's Zizek wants to say that uh, similar to maybe how you know he talks about Hegel. Yes, he's a monist, but it's not your traditional monist. Hegel is is a teleological thinker, but he's not your traditional teleological thinker. He his teleology is retroactive. It goes from back to front. Yes. Not front to back. It's not the thing begins this way and then it ends this way. It's he's trying to talk about his teleology involves how things are quilted. Yes. Quilting. Yes. And I, you know, I think Zizek likes to talk about how like we all we always perceive um uh certain choices that we make as as being free acts and then or maybe the opposite but but, but very often we we perceive um acts that felt like they were uh felt like they they were um necessity necessities but yeah. in actuality they were free choices so i i think there is the compatibilism yeah, I think the the contingency involves we have some freedom to to decide whether uh, to decide what the meaning of events in the past were and whether they uh, you know were certainties. Um, and perhaps I think Zizek says that's kind of what Hegel thinks. Uh, I think it's <clears throat> I think it's crucial here. Uh... For my part, that I have a lot of trouble going back and forth between necessity and contingency. I have a lot of trouble keeping in my mind uh, the specific, like really the specific <laughs> definitions here. Um, and so when he gets to the point where he says necessity itself depends on contingency, <laughs> that's like very, it's very, it's a key, it's the key, it may be in fact the key point here. Uh, so necessity is a thing that, that, doesn't require external inputs to be what it is, right? Something happens by necessity, regardless of, ex of, of, of anything else around it. Whereas literally contingency is, is almost the opposite. It depends on, depends on cir circumstances around it. To say that necessity itself depends on contingency leads me in, uh, what did you say? One man donkey show, Nance? It's like the, yeah. the <laughs> you know, it, um, so it, it's it's like people who want to make an argument from necessity say things have things have to be the way they are, and that is why they are the way they are. But another way to come up with a, a type of necessity would be things have to be the way they are because they already are the way that they are. God, that sounds so stupid, but well, I, I think I think one of the things we were circling last time, or at least I brought this up, was that from from a misreading of this place, we start getting we start getting reification. We start getting arguments from necessity that are actually arguments of contingency. And and but presented as necessity. And when you have that with a, a population that isn't critical. Uh, what you'll have is is a dogmatism that can be used to great effect. And so, we, yeah, maybe maybe to go off on a tangent and forgive me, but go. So you might you you might make like uh like to bring it to real world stuff. Like young black men living in the ghetto are are going to lead a life of crime and debauchery because young black men from the ghetto lead lives of crime and debauchery and, and leave it at that. Or you could say young black men living in the ghetto are, are, go are going to most likely lead a life of crime and debauchery 
because of all these material conditions that that leave them with no other option but to lead the life of crime and debauchery. So it's not like an essential, like prescriptive thing, but it is a descriptive necessity. It is a, a compatibilism. It's a false compatibilism um, because it is, it's, it's making, it's going from, it's going, going from, for example, so you're arguing, you're, you're arguing a, a sociological kind of standpoint. Um, and this is, this is a, this has always been, this has been something that's been an interesting discussion between me and my wife as she's been going through this PhD program. Um, because there's a lot of people that are getting involved in say queer theory and in, in critical theory for the first time in their lives, getting involved in this stuff, not just not just feeling really activist, but actually digging into the theory. And what and what inevitably comes up is that all of these these theories at their base, at their heart, is relying on taking taking humanistic things, taking 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 qualitative circumstances and reducing them to numbers. And then build, building theories based on what what you're gathering from there on. You're making you're you're get you're gathering data, and you're turning these data into into theories, and you're applying predictions based on these theories, and you're finding graphs that fit trends. Your 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 theories are meant to predict, and what ends up happening is you start thinking that what you've done is you've you've understood a law of something. When all you've actually done was found a right it's now pareidolia. corresponding moment. It's it's a, a pareidolia. Now? A pareidolia. You're 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 recognizing patterns and assuming that those patterns are tr are are true or or bear truth when in reality they're just patterns out of consequence. Correct. Yes, and they they coincide, but it doesn't one doesn't say one about the other or or the relationship isn't a causal relationship; it, it's a coincidental relationship. Well, and and also key to this key to the situation is the perception of objectivity that is happening when they're interacting with these numbers. They're coming up with these things. They're losing any sense of distance between themselves and actual objectivity. So they're getting more and more objective, and you have this this uh, one of the one of the you know paradoxes of getting halfway to the wall and then getting halfway to the wall again and they there is a tendency in sociology to revert to this concept called uh, physics envy where they're under the impression that what they're doing because it is so inherently mathematical in cer in certain cases that what they're doing is objective science when like the most objective we could say of objective science is the physical the physicists are just now heading over the cliff to, cliff of objectivity when dealing with with uh, with quantum physics, right? Yeah, so dude. Even the, super determination and yeah, yeah, we don't know and, anything. And, and while while all of that is very you know it's very out there and it's very hard for especially us mere mortals to grasp. The point is that that the fact that it is out there is at least a sign that what we are taking to be objective is not. But since we are taking, since we have been taking it to be objective or objective as such, we're taking these things that are contingent to be necessities. Yeah. And that is, that has led to all kinds of problems. And this is precisely why we are here reading this, trying to, trying to make sense of it. And I didn't mean, I'm sorry for getting us off, um, off track. You could have just stopped it off and it would have been super sexy hilarious getting so sorry off. for getting us off bro oh did i do that <laughs> hello i'm not sorry i'm not sorry we are in fact fucking at the moment should um, we continue from to make this point clear or jordan do you have do you have something on this i was just gonna say that um to try to maybe uh explain this in a way zizek would talk about or, you know since he's always talking about Stalin. <laughs> I think okay. Zizek would say that Stalin had uh, the kind of vulgar teleology that uh, a Marxist or at least Zizek would not support. And that is the teleology that 
what I'm doing now will be justified by will what I'm doing now, which I seems will uh, in the future be seen as a necessity. The big other in the future. If we have communism, it'll work out. The big other in the future will make what's uh, well will make what seems like what I'm doing right now that's bad that is a contingent act into a necessity. Yeah. And so going again from from beginning to end, and what Zizek says is no, you can only do the necessity uh, retroactively. You don't get to do it when you're doing the act. Absolutely. You don't get to, you don't get to say uh, this contingent act is a necessity and somehow get out of culpability. And so what what Zizek's mm -hmm. teleology does is makes it so that the the I don't know the subject um, does not get to get out of that that bind of their actions being contingent. I mean, um, so I don't I don't know if that helps flesh things out a little bit. No, I, I like that. Would it does it seem like it would be fair to say like a, a way of a, a way of also stating that is like if it is in fact a necessity, then it will happen whether or not. I do anything about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, perhaps I, you know, I, I would just say that I, I think Zizek would take a strong stand against uh, anything that, that gets the subject out of recognizing that their actions are, um, are contingent and that any, any quilting point, which maybe ties things together into a necessity cannot at some point be requilted into recognizing that action as a contingency again at some point. Mm -hmm. Great. I do Thank like you. that. So, um, some, somebody want to read from, to make this point clear. Okay. Uh, to make this point clear, let us recall how at some turning point of the subjects or collective history, an act of interpretation, which is in itself thoroughly contingent, non-deducible from the preceding series, renders the preceding chaos readable anew by introducing into its order and meaning, that is to say, necessity. John Irving's unjustif unjustifiably underrated novel, A Prayer for Owen Meany, is a kind of Lacanian roman, ah, these, a tract on this theme of how necessity arises out of a traumatic contingency. Its hero, Owen Meany, accidentally strikes with a baseball bat and kills his best friend's mother. In order to endure this trauma, to, uh, to integrate it into his symbolic universe, he conceives himself as an instrument of God, whose actions have been preordained and can be considered God's intervention in the world. Even his death itself is a beautiful, obsessive reversal of the customary process of trying to evade an evil prophecy whereby one unwitting, unwittingly brings about its realization. When Owen takes some accident as a prophecy that he will die in Vietnam, he does all he can to make the prophecy come true. He is terrified over the prospect of missing his death, since in that case, all sense would be lost and he himself would be guilty of the death of his friend's mother. Very much like what you just said, Jordan. Um, yeah. Although this retroactive necessity seems to be limited to symbolic processes, it is of extreme interest to psychoanalysis that the same logic can be discerned even in today's biology. In the work of Stephen Jay Gould, for example, who freed Darwinism of evolutionary teleology and exhibited the radical contingency in the formation of new natural kinds, the Burgess Shell which he analyzes in Wonderful Life, is unique because the fossils preserved in it belong to the moment when development could have taken an entirely different course. It captures nature, so to speak, at the point of its undecidability, at the point when a number of possibilities coexist, which today, in retrospect, form an already established line of evolution, seem absurd, unthinkable. At the point when we have before us an excess of wealth of today, unthinkable forms of complex, highly developed organisms, which are constructed according to different plans to those of today and became extinct, not because of their inherent lesser value or unadaptability, but above all, because of their contingent discordance with a particular environment. Mm. We could even venture to say that the Burgess shell is a symptom of nature, 
a monument which cannot be located within the line of evolution as it had then developed since it represents the outline of a possible alternative history, a monument which allows us to see what was sacrificed, consumed, what was lost so that evolution, so that the evolution we know today could take place. Okay, dude, that hits so hard. Something that pops to mind and, and stop me if I'm taking us too far afield. Um, when he says we could even venture to say that the British sale is a symptom of nature, sounds like verging on panpsychism, right? Like he's being a panpsychoanalyst psychoanalyst or something like that. Um, if you conceive of, of, of life itself as a form of thinking, and, and there's, there are folks that do that. I mean, that's, that's definitely, uh, what's his name? Sam Harris is definitely headed down that road. I think his lady's taking him there. Um, but th the idea that you have these moments of pure possibility, and then you have something like the Burgess shell showing us that showing us that that was definitely the case. There was this moment of pure possibility and then something happened. And then we ended up down this line. It, it absolutely throws out the idea of a teleological prediction at that moment. Like you could not possibly have said where, where things were going to go. And that's the, that's the mistake that creationists make is that when, when they're, when they, uh, if you ever watch a creationist debate, a, an evolutionist, it always comes down to this, uh, the uh, watchmaker uh, logic of like, well, we see we see the eyeball and it couldn't have ever gotten here if there wasn't the need for this and that. And it is it is because there is a misinterpretation of necessity for contingency, or sorry, contingency for necessity that we ended up where we are today isn't because of something so simple as the way you think. Um, that's That's what I was feeling off of this. Also, I love Stephen Jay Gould. I find I find his uh his shit hilarious in some cases. I like to I like to play with the idea of like an inverted panpsychism. Um but also that gets into weird shit that a lot of what Zizek does kind of directly says why that weird shit is wrong. Like I like, I like D and G I like CCRU weird shit. Um, but I do think that's all kind of like missing the point. Yeah. I think it, there's a difference between, I guess, um, uh you know going heavy on improvisational music and actually composing um and i think i think that there's a there's a point at which you can go whoa man but like what really is a hand and you could do that all over the place and uh i i love to sometimes do that but yeah i think in in the, when you're actually trying to sit and think it it definitely takes you off of the takes you off the map there's nowhere to get where what are you going to do once you get there but yeah what if what if what if societies are actually a super organism and then we're just kind of a cell within the organism okay grab another what? tab okay <laughs> um where are we? it is that where we are yeah yeah it, it is, is essential. it is essential to grasp how this kind of relationship of contingency to necessity where necessity derives from the retroactive effect of contingency, where necessity is always a backwards necessity, which is why Minerva fly, Minerva's owl flies only at dusk, is just another variation on the substance as subject motif. That is to say, as long as contingency is reduced to the form of appearance of an underlying necessity, to an appearance through which deeper necessity is realized, we are still on the level of substance. The substantial necessity is that which prevails. Substance conceived as subject, on the contrary, is that moment when the substantial necessity reveals itself to be the retroactive effect of a contingent process. We have thus also answered the question of why four and not three types of judgment. If the development of the judgments had been resolved with the judgment of necessity, it would have remained on the level of substance. 
on the level of the substantial necessity of the notion which, by means of its partition, develops its particular content for within itself. Such an image of the self-movement of the notion, which posits its own particular content, may appear very Hegelian, corresponds to the conventional idea about Hegel's work of the notion. Yet, we are actually as far as possible from the Hegelian subject, which retroactively posits its own presuppositions. Only with the fourth type of judgment is the fact fully affirmed that the truth of the substance is the subject. Only here does the subject posit its own substantial presupposition. It retroactively posits the contingent conditions of its notional necessity. The core of Hegel's positing the presupposition consists precisely in this retroactive conversion of contingency into necessity and this conferring of a form of necessity on the contingent circumstances. There's a lot there, and I, I think we, kind of circled it a bit. He pointed out earlier that you're missing something if you stop at the at the conventional three uh, mm. uh, types of judgment, and that's why contingency is necessary. He has he has provided he has provided not a proof per se, but the the series of steps that explain why contingency is the, the necessary fourth step of judgment to bring it from <clears throat> from substance to subject. What we're trying to get to is subject. At least that's uh, what I think I'm getting from this. Okay. Oh no, he's gonna go into the redoubling again. <laughs> <laughs> that's the good stuff. That's, the, that's that good good. You don't even need to drop another tab. You're about to be dropped into the tab. All right. Shall you we pick shall up? we go on? Yeah. Yeah, I can where are we at? Yet to discern. Yet to discern. Yet to discern the fact that with the fourth type of judgment, we achieve the level of the subject. One does not even need a sophisticated conceptual apparatus. That's good. Uh, it yeah, suffices for oneself <laughs> that this type uh, contains what we inadequately call evaluation. Evaluative judgment, which, according to philosophical common sense, concerns the subject, subjective evaluation. It is not enough here just to draw attention to the elementary fact that with Hegel, judgment is not subjective in the customary meaning of the term, but a matter of the relationship of the object itself to its own notion. The radical conclusion to be drawn that there is no subject without a gap separating the object from its notion. That this gap between the object and its notion is the ontological condition of the subject's emergence. The subject is nothing but the gap in the substance, in the inadequacy of the substance to itself. What we call subject is the perspective illusion by means of which the substance perceives itself in distorted subjective form. Hmm. More crucially, the fact is here generally overlooked that such a type of judgment on the correspondence of an object to its notion implies a kind of reflective redoubling of the subject's will and desire. This sounds like Dennett. I mean, actually, it sounds like what Dennett would shit on um, with the idea of like of consciousness being a, an illusion. Uh, because it, what it, it sounds like is what what he's saying is the idea that you, you think what you're doing is subjective valuation but what's actually happening is you're you're occupying the moment of a substance that's that's applying subjective will and desire to your evaluation you are basically seeing what you're trying to see mm. it, yeah in terms of I, I i i you know i hate to do this but there's actually the best understanding i've had of kind of what Zizek is trying to to say by this is actually in a, a different book and maybe this example will help you or or other people but um um 
you wouldn't mind uh, if Go I go for it. it. No, no, do that. Um, Anything so you is, hate to do, I'm fucking here for. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is from Zizek's book, uh, God in Pain and Versions of Apocalypse. And um, it, it's basically when he was going through his phase of really being into Christianity. Um, but this is kind of getting at um, the idea of uh, the subject is substance um, and how uh, the substance's lack of not coinciding with itself um, uh, is could be seen as being the, the subject. So uh, Zizek says, in Christianity, the gap that separates God from man is not effectively sublated in the figure of Christ as God-man. But in the most tense moment of crucifixion, when Christ himself despairs, Father, why have you forsaken me? In this moment, the gap is transposed into God himself as the gap that separates Christ from God the Father. The properly dialectical trick here is that the very feature which appeared to me to, appeared to separate me from God turns out to unite me with God. And so I think we're getting here kind of what that that um doubling of the uh the 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 double inversion is is that um the the subject's uh inability to to fully conceive the absolute is uh coincides with the absolute's inability to conceive its very self, with the substance, substance's inability to fully coincide with itself. Um, I don't know if that, that helps at all, but that example help, helped me. Um, in terms of what Zizek is trying to get here, where, you know, when he talks about how, you know, uh, it's it's all inclusive. The 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 your your gaze and inability to fully conceive of the substance is 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 included in the substance itself. So I don't know. Yeah, I mean that brings it, it re reminds me of of his uh, example of the 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 Kafka the Kafka yeah. example of the the farmer finding himself at the door that was made for him and realizing that or coming to terms with the fact that the whole time he was thinking of this, this great big other, the great big other was thinking of him um, specifically. And I feel like, I feel like I, uh, along with, along with your uh, biblical uh, reference and any number of the other ones, I feel like, yes, I understand that but what does it mean <laughs> like but where does that take me like what am i meant to understand now i feel like i'm meant to understand that i conceive of myself as subject but that very conception is is actually the substance of me that is trying to impose subjectivity uh but i don't know and i'm not sure what i'm supposed to do with that knowledge either I mean, the way I think about it is that usually we we posit the subject as somehow not being able to get at the noumena. And what Hegel mm -hmm. and Zizek wants to say is that maybe the reason we can't get at the noumena is because it it's not there. Yes. <laughs> I have I have always <laughs> felt that that was a part of the thing. Especially like I, I loved his uh, his his example of uh, video game architecture where like you see all yeah. these buildings That's and there's nothing example. actually in the buildings. Yeah. Uh, they're just you're just seeing the outside of the buildings. In fact, there that isn't even the outside of a building because the building itself isn't there, motherfucker. You're just it's all. But again, this is getting into the kind of like you know Dennett like, uh, you know. Are are we are we really just hallucinating? No, we're not just hallucinating. There is there is clearly a consistency to our our as as crazily different as all of our experiences are. There seems to be a consistency there. It doesn't have to resolve in a noumenon, of course. Mm. 
but we do have we do have a number of of eerily convergent impressions of what we take to be real and i and i do find that this i find myself getting closer to it as i'm reading this as lost as i as i am i sure um, yeah and actually you know I, i'll take this moment to point out that i'm really grateful for you you two guys uh going through this process of bewilderment with me so that so that i know that i'm not just uniquely i don't know <laughs> just a, just a moron like no we're we're all kind of sitting here okay i don't know <laughs> boy. yeah um uh yeah um i'll go on um it is in this precise sense that one has to conceive lacan's dialectic of desire his basic thesis that desire is always desire of a desire desire is never directly aimed at some object but is always desire squared the subject finds in himself a multitude of heterogeneous even mutually exclusive desires and the question with which he is thus faced is which desire should i choose which desire should I desire? The constitutive reflexivity of desire is revealed in the paradoxical sentiment of being angry or ashamed at oneself when one desires something that one considers unworthy of one's desire. A deadlock uh, which could be described precisely in the words, I don't want to desire my desire. What we call valuation is thus always based in this reflexivity of desire, which is of course possibly only within the symbolic order. The fact that desire is always already symbolically mediated means nothing but that it is always the desire of a desire. This reflexivity of desire opens up the dimension of symbolic deception. If the subject wants X, it does not follow from this that he also wants this desire. Or rather, it is possible for him to feign his desire for X precisely in order to hide the fact he does not want X. The way this reflexivity is connected with the motive of contingency is not difficult to grasp. Let us take, for example, the philosophical, philosophical motif of values. It is mistaken to say of people in so-called traditional societies, societies which are based on unreflected acceptance of a system of values, that they possess values. What we call from our external perspective, their values, the people themselves accept as an unquestioned framework of which they are not conscious as such. They entirely lack the reflective attitude to it implied by the notion of value. As soon as we start to talk about values, we have a priori positive values as something relative, contingent, whose preserve is not unquestionable, as something which it is necessary to discuss. That is to say, precisely to value. We cannot evade the question of whether these values are true values of whether they correspond to their notion. In Hegelese, insofar as the notion of value is posited, explicated, insofar as this notion arrives at its being for itself, value is, ex is experienced as something contingent, bound to the problem of value. Have we chosen the right values? How do we evaluate them? And so on. The same begin can be said about the notion of profession in pre-capitalist society in which the position of an individual is primarily decided by a set of traditional organic links. It is anachronistic to talk about a profession even on an immediate level. One can sense how inadequate it is to say that in the Middle Ages someone had the profession of serve. The very notion of profession presupposes an indifferent, abstract individual delivered from his determinatedness by substantial organic links who can freely decide on his profession, choose it. And yet another third level, it is the same with the notion of artistic style. It is anachronistic to talk about medieval or even classical styles. We can talk about them only when the possibility of choice of different styles is posited as such, when therefore style is perceived as something basically arbitrary. So do we have any any thoughts about that? First, my one one thought is that uh, that Slavoj can go fuck himself on what is or is not difficult to grasp. Um, that's, <laughs> that's, um, 
the I I I feel like it's a it's a it's an exceedingly interesting to go into the discourse of, for example, the possession of something like a value. Um, I think of the 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 concept of having things as exceedingly important um, in the way that people speak. For example, of having a child, having children, uh, having a daughter. For example, um, the way that we use this concept of possession uh, happens. Uh, differently in 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 the doing than than in the saying um but for some people they they really do take a lot of the uh, a lot of the emphasis on actual ownership Mm -hmm. into that possession Uh, for example to have a daughter is also is to own a daughter for some Mm -hmm. in some cases um there's also the the notion of 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 human beings having a tendency to not want to get rid of things that they believe they have uh, uh, loss aversion is a kind of a known thing. And that, and again, I might be perseverating on a very specific section here. So if I'm t- taking anybody too far out, uh, feel free to stop me. But I think it's, it's, it's ex- when I was saying before, like, okay, cool. I feel like I'm getting this knowledge, but I'm not sure what I want to do with, what should I do with this knowledge? feel like it's it's actually he's he's sort of talking about this is why it's important that we tie this to desire and that we tie this to the i don't know maybe even the um the truth value of your desire for example what is it that you actually desire rather than what you claim to desire or what you think you desire if you for example desire to to be a father are you desiring to own a daughter Mm -hmm. Um, if you claim to have values are you do you want to appear as if you have these values or do you want to actually do the work that it takes to correspond to those values um two of us and i don't don't know what your background is jordan but myself and nance were both veterans right and so Mm -hmm. in some ways we have we have uh, ascended to a, a, a pinnacle value in American society, which is, you know, the masculine ideal of putting your uh, and body on the line. Internalized a lot of values that aren't really ours, but we can't see oh, yeah. a bit of. Yeah, the basic training uh, 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 doctrine went, both, went into us both. Um, and so, you know, in a way, we have these values that we... I, at least I was, I'm not going to say we, I'm not going to speak for Nancy here, but I would say I would rather not have actually, and that I cannot even shed myself of in some cases, um, which is interesting because it seems like there's a large chunk of society that claims to have these values. That's weird. I didn't see them there over the last 20 years. Um, and, and so it's very key then to start putting some actual truth value to what it is your desire is. And it does have a pol- a huge political fucking dimension when it when it's a difference between let's go to an easy one when is the difference between claiming to 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 not want racism versus realistically simply not wanting to be seen as a racist? It's a very simple one, and it's one that we see a lot in in the difference between not wanting something bad and more actually not wanting to be the person doing the bad thing you know i think most most diehard liberals in this country would not want there to not be police officers for example but they will Mm -hmm. gladly put a thing that says defund the police all over their cars and this is no judgment on on their performativity as opposed to truly inhabiting the beliefs you claim to have and we have a society that is essentially built around the 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 faint. It's not faint his desire. We have a society that is 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 built around the idea of of valuing values. Of actually, I mean, like you can literally put a dollar sign on values now. This is why Zizek is always on a rant of, of the Starbucks cup and the um, and such. That it's it's very important. It doesn't mean don't drink Starbucks, but it it does mean don't think you're doing anything good for the fucking rainforest when you're buying a special starbucks cup because you're not or maybe there's something more that you could have done i think that's i think that's where it starts the 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 rubber hits the road around here is is actually assigning getting getting to the truth of what it is you're saying you desire what versus what it is you actually desire yeah i i think um 
kind of tie it a, a, a little bit of what you're saying directly into the text, you know, Zizek references, you know, the Lacanian uh, maxim that desire is always desire of the other. Um, and I think we can also, and, uh, and Zizek says this, um, that belief is always belief of the other, not in so much as that we, yes, we do take our beliefs from others, of course, but more so in the more literal way that it's not uh, so important that uh, we believe what we believe. It's more important that we know that Whatever. there's someone else is believing uh, on behalf of us, or you know, where we, you know, at least we can outsource our belief, you know. And I, you know, I, I think the easy example to use is, you know, um, you know, uh, Christians, you know, people who go to church. It's not so important that they actually believe, but at least, you know, they're. Uh, I don't know. There's somebody out there believing, you know. Well, there's somebody um, believing that they believe. There, yeah, yeah. It's like you know, oh, you know, they, they, got, you know, yeah. I don't believe, but there has, there's someone else, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, out there who really does believe, and that's kind of a salve for me because I can go mm -hmm. on kind of being in my kind of half belief and you know, perseverating. But I know, you know, there's the, you know, someone who doesn't have any of the doubts, um, and. As far as the three examples he goes through, you know, desire, talking about values, professions, I think the commonality between all those th things is that there are always these th values, uh, desire, professions in the middle, middle ages. There is no way to speak with, to speak to those things eminently or as such. They're always mm -hmm. mediated. There is no way yeah. for these people in traditional societies to speak about values as such. There is no pe way for because you could not have chosen other values. Yes, they they weren't aware that the, uh, uh, values is always some is is only something that can be uh, posed uh, when you're looking at the thing uh, externally. And just like professions in the Middle Ages, there is no way to speak about professions as such um there's no way to speak about desire as such these things are always mediated there's no way to talk about them from within them i've got a uh i've got a random outside uh example that that coincides with this uh and as i want to do i, I like to tie marcuse into into zizek i i find there to be overlap and and i i think one of my long-term projects is figuring out how to do this um, but uh, Marcuse, early on in the in in One Dimensional Man, he's discussing the the kind of inevitability of the at least the Western subject to be indo so indoctrinated that it is impossible to to determine what genuine what your genuine self even is because you're you've just been programmed from the start. Now I'm I'm paraphrasing and really really bluntly so uh but he talks about a concept called um introjection which is a, a psychological uh term it's a it's a defense mechanism that is is where you start adapt you start adopting the mannerisms and the the even the thought patterns of whoever it is that's that that you need to 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 get to get along in life um and so it's it's it kind of assumes a, a sense of you're taking on someone else's psyche as your own. Um, and what Marcuse is saying is that actually introjection itself is impossible because the world that you're born into, you don't, there is no genuine authentic yourself to begin with. And, and what you are, you, you are, you are like, as if you're born into the matrix there, there is, you have no conception of what the reality is around you. And you're, you're simply given these symbolic structures that you, that you then construct a self around um and it's it's not to say that you don't exist as an individual subject but that you're in your subjectivity itself is already objectified from the beginning it's masks all and the way down yeah this is yeah. this is the double inversion there is no mm -hmm. uh, there is, everything is al always already a reflection there is no original thing from which uh, the mirror is reflecting. It feels very Baudrillardian at that at that point. You're like, 
I start wondering. I, in fact, I have always wondered: uh, is there is there maybe a need for development of like a kind of an orders of ideology similar to the orders of uh, of simulation that Baudrillard has? Because I feel like there might be a, a, a use for describing formats of ideology that are distinct from one another. But why bring in Baudrillard? Why do that? <laughs> don't do that in fact uh, no i think do do that i i think i think especially I might, do do that um I might let mikey do that <laughs> yes um, i think i'm at the uh i think i'm at my uh mental capacity yeah me too. <laughs> how about you nance yeah i gotta go do uh responsible person stuff right now anyway it's that time of the week to brush the teeth <laughs> yeah that, <laughs> today's today's shower day guys so i'm gonna <laughs> well um, hey thanks a lot guys thanks a lot i really got, get a lot out of this really yeah, yeah i it. actually i do think uh i feel i feel productive having gone over that gone over this again um I really do. Yeah, I, I think we uh, we made some progress to, to getting at least 50% of the way to understanding this chapter. <laughs> Always 50% of the way. <laughs> Next time is another 50%. Zenu, man, that damn Zenu. Doesn't he bring All up right. Zenu in this chapter? Or am I tripping? I mean, this is in early '90s, so I don't think Xenu's even out there yet. Like, unless he himself was already, uh, I don't know, subject to the Scientological uh, shit. When you say Xenu, you're talking about Scientology, right? Not Scientology. Xenu's paradox. Halfway, halfway, halfway. You're thinking Xeno. <laughs> yeah, Xenu is the the Zeno is like the the big alien fucking Scientology. Oh yeah. Oh, Zenu, Zeno. It's all the same. But actually, I'm, I'm, my, my, new, my new aesthetic reflection is definitely going to be Xenu's Paradox. <laughs> Xenu's Paradox. <laughs> Heck yeah, dude. Fucking love it, Nance. Uh, Heck yeah, guys. All right. Cheers, Thank guys. you, guys. Have a nice evening, gentlemen. Thank, Thank Have you a very good much. Guys. Um, we'll be back soon. Yeah. yeah. Let's do it. Awesome. Have a good night, guys. Cheers.